we need to come out of this abusive model of um, hidden data acquisition. In a way, society is waking up to this um, abusive system. Like we have the systemic and the endemic racism, it's an abusive system and they data mine and then they fire at you and control you via giving you emotionally stimulating things. How well it's, it's articulating truth. That's what we're interested in, truth, and not interested in being controlled and manipulated by sensationalizing reality so that we are just falling into this panic phase, oh, I'll buy that, and we're mapping it in society, we're seeing it, and we're seeing it online. So reality is really filtering back into the internet because it was built from the non-reality of abuse. Now we're coming out and going, it has to be equal, and we have to be sovereign in our in ourselves hello and welcome to a uh, another exciting installment of lick hashtag lick i know the, the name's weird but it is live inspirational common unity collaboration my name is mark abadi i am your host and it is my deep pleasure to bring you uh, luminaries and uh, change makers from around the world uh, we have a fantastic change maker, uh, Jim Fournier. Uh, he's going to be talking about restoring reality on the internet. Um, he talks it like this. Online advertising isn't just creepy. It's created dynamics where reality itself is collateral damage. So reality is changing. Jim has 40 years of experience in sustainability, 30 years in tech, and over 20 years in organizing communities with technology for higher purpose. He's the founder and CEO of True, T-R-U, a social media publishing platform built to elevate truth. True is a network for organizations and people built on technology that provides a verified chain of custody for digital content. It offers a clean, a uh, collaboratively curated feed with no ads, noise, or other surveillance, true.net. Jim also founded, um, or funded in, in the past, a key social network patent resulting in, in the founder's share in LinkedIn. Um, and then it was after that, when working with Victor Gray, that they realized how to archive decentralized internet data exchange, and they filed a patent on JLink. Uh, in April 2015. And Jim operates as the CEO of JLink, which creates the technology that automates the digitally signed internet data exchange and powers true. JLink is not a blockchain, but it uses some of the same technological puzzle pieces in elegant new ways. You can check that out on jlink.com. So, yeah, is, uh, the, the future of the internet is here, and we are here with the, one of the founding daddies let's see let's bring in jim jim welcome to the show hi mark thank you very much it's great to be here so nice to have you so um tell us what's what's going on are you are you really on the takedown of facebook and and when i told you that <laughs> one of the things this was going to go live on was facebook you you mentioned the irony of that well, I, uh, a friend of mine who goes by Identity Woman said, uh, we hated Facebook since before it existed. Um, so I don't know. Fa Facebook's going to be around for a long time. Uh, we are trying to, to create an alternative for people who are really looking for a space that's cleaner, safer, free of noise, and where you can really collaborate together in different ways. So, so what, what, what is this really... What are we doing? When you say cleaner, what do you mean? Well, the, the internet kind of took a wrong turn 20 years ago, in, in a lot of our opinion, uh, where the business model went to online advertising. And that had a lot of unintended consequences that I don't think anybody you know, foresaw when it, when it went that way. Uh, but it's really created a situation where inducing people to keep watching something is the goal. Mm -hmm. And so tech spends a lot of time on psychological manipulation to induce you to keep scrolling and ideally click. And then it turns out that if something's emotionally provocative, it's more likely to earn revenue than whether it's true. And so we've created these dynamics where delivering people more and more emotionally incendiary and provocative information earns more ad revenue. 
And a lot of the consequences of what's happened to society and the internet stem from this business model. So, I mean, this is just the sort of, isn't this capitalism? Isn't that what we're really dealing with? Um, it's a particular combination of capitalism and technology. And, um, you know, there's a lot of discussion now about <clears throat> capitalism and business and free enterprise and are they the same thing? But also, if you combine technology and monopoly capitalism, you can get to certain consequences. But also, if you look at the history of things, uh, you know, things get to a certain point and then there is kind of punctuated equilibrium. Somebody, you know, things get to a point where people really realize they don't like them and look for an alternative and the alternative um, outcompetes what's there. That's also how capitalism right, works. Right, right. So, so tell us about what, what's different about the system and, and how does it, I mean, because what they're doing is they're, they're, they're basically feeding advertisers, right, who, who enable who enable the, the system to be free uh, as they mine our data. So what- Yeah, I mean, the, the, the tech business model is you are the product. <laughs> so you're a user, the, the user views ads, the ads are sold to advertisers and that's the business model. Um, anything, you, anything you consume is just sort of necessary to get you to see ads. But um, so the, the alternative business model, we, we have three parts to a business model. Um, and, and I should talk a little bit about how it works to get into that. But, but basically, in the long run, we're charging large companies to actually have a direct relationship with consumers. Right. And, and big corporates really want this. And in Europe, they're kind of required to have it under GDPR because the surveillance model has been essentially outlawed. So the, the long-term vision is that the big companies actually want to talk directly with people. People would rather have control of their own lives. Much of tech is just kind of parasite on that relationship. How do we get there from here? Mm -hmm. So the place that we've gone to with True is really more serving the kind of network organizations and networks of networks that we come out of as organizers and activists and socially, where a lot of the, the, the entities sort of that we're dealing with are themselves networks of relationships with other entities. Right. And tech as it's been constructed and social media as it's been constructed doesn't really provide a way for organizations to network with each other. The network is all a social network where the unit of, of networking is the individual person. And if you want to try and use that platform, you have to sort of shoehorn other things into it. Mm -hmm. You might be able to put up a page that has a group, but there's no real way for groups to subscribe to groups and pass each other the best information that might be relevant as kind of their output. Right. So that's what True is aiming to do. And so, so how, how, does it, how does it actually look? I mean, what, what would people do uh, uh, different than say Facebook or whatever? Well, let me give you a, a, a quick picture of it. Um, I'm gonna switch to a screen share for a second. It's, it's in uh, early beta, so this is just launched. Um, this is the, the version that's just gone live. Do um, you see the screen there? Uh, I do, but it, um, hold on a second. It <laughs> well, yeah. I'll keep talking while you, you put yeah, it yeah. up. Good, we're all good. Okay, so um, it's, this is it on computer. It, it will work on phone. It's, it's just a web app. You hit it in a website and you log in. Um, we require you to create an account with a mobile phone. So we, we at least create some obstacle to fake accounts. Mm -hmm. uh, you can use either your real name or an avatar. Um, I've just gone to my home feed. So this, is, this feed is made up of posts from all of the organizations and networks that I connect with. So everything that I connect with is, is combined in what I see. If I go to this this list, I can see all the, we call them nodes, but all the, all the organizations, all the entities that I'm connected to. So it's like a new, it's a news feed of organizations that you're connected to. Yeah, and an organization can be one person. Right. 
So you, you can create a node as a personal blog. You could do one for a, a, an informal group. Uh, you could do one for a company or a nonprofit or even a, an academic institution. If and I what, determines, it, what determines the placement of the, of the stream of the data? Uh, right now, it's just filtered in, by time. You know, we're very early, but we'll be able to add more filtering under an individual's control. Um, then the other navigation paradigm is if I go to a network, which is an organization that has a list of other nodes that have agreed to connect to it, I can preview the organizations that are part of this network. And then if I go to one of them and I visit it, now I've left that network and I'm on their feed. Um, I can go look at all networks here. I can pick another network. So you're on the um, network specific feed. So it's kind of like if, if, if all the groups and pages on Facebook were individual entities as well. Exactly. And they're first class entities that you can subscribe to. And in fact, so then when you're within an, a network, it has this private channel where it's much more like social. People can post and upvote and comment and, and elevate things. And then there's a list of the people who are members of it. And then some of the people are curators. The curators can choose things from the, the private channel and publish them to the public feed. And to get, to get access to the private channel, do you need to like join that group or something? Yes, and groups can set their membership to either open um, by request or by invite only. And they can also set it so that the private channel is public and visible to everybody, okay. only visible to members. They could also have a completely closed node where even the members are hidden. And, and is there any, any sort of financial model that is uh, um, like a membership model that might come in there? That Say, um, group, like, like, you know how we, they have these mighty networks is one of yeah, the... Yeah, yeah. So I'll, I'll go through the, the business model. Oh. Um, it's free to create a personal account. It's free to create like a micro blog or an informal group. And it's free if you're an organization to accept an invite to somebody else's network. To add a network to your nodes that you can list others costs a tiny fee, just like in beta a dollar, but just to keep them from being too many of them eventually larger networks will pay more. So if you start running a whole marketplace on the platform, when you sign on a link, people land in your network. So you're able to sort of build spaces within it. Then we also have a, um, a sponsorship model that we're still building out, but we think is really likely to become the big driver, where if there's an activist organization that's, that's got a fairly large network, it's got other networks connected to it, and a, a sponsor comes along that wants to reach that audience and identify themselves with it. So an advertiser that wants to actually support Black Lives Matter could sponsor large networks, but it's a kind of decentralized thing. So they could sponsor one or more networks. When people post and those get republished by networks up into the larger network, the sponsorship dollars can flow back down that chain of what we call signed data provenance, which is what creates reality on the system, where you can see where was something first posted, who republished it, how did it get to the network where I am now. That's all digitally signed. We can use that same chain to push revenue back out to people that are putting content on the system, and then True takes 10%. So, this is a model where the, you know, what we're calling data reality, the fact that we can show a, a signed chain of who posted something and who's responsible for it, we can use that same chain as a way of, of moving revenue out to the grassroots. Right, right. And, and we could do this both for for-profits that want to sponsor, but also for foundations that want to figure out how to push money out to the periphery, to the grassroots of networks. And then finally, the long-term business model is that there's a, a much deeper part that I won't go into in detail, but it's this, this data control system that's under it, the J-Link, where 
if I, if somebody invites me on that's a company and has data about me, they'll actually populate the data they have for me under my control. I accumulate the data from all the companies that share what they have with me, and I can set a standard profile and share it with new ones in one click. I can also set my preferences and permissions about what I want to share with companies. So right. I can be anonymous but safely connect with them. At scale, we charge corporations a lot for that part of the system. Right. So our, our long-term business model is, is to charge the big companies to be in relationship with customers under customers' own control. And, and, and what, what do the customers themselves get from that data uh, sharing? Well, it, it creates a way, for example, if, if I go to one of these, um, I'm trying to find one that's a for-profit. Um, if I go to a, um, a company, a, a node that's actually a company, and um, share data with them, I could basically subscribe to their feed using right. True, and they're, they're putting their announcements into the same feed I'm getting my, my friends and my group's info on. Yes. Or I could go to their page if I actually have a relationship with them, say it's a company I do business with, mm -hmm. and I could manage my data sharing with them under full GDPR control. If I say, you can't have this email anymore and I turn it off, it actually sends them a signed instruction to their service saying, turn, you know, right. delete my data and send me a signed confirmation back that you did so. Right. I understand. I, I love that, the, the data control. I'm wondering, are there any monetary um, reward systems for subscribing to a company and giving them your data? Um, that would be up for a company to offer under one of these agreements. Right. right. Um, we would charge the company for having a presence on the platform the same way we would charge the sponsors for using it. But we're also very much trying to create an ecosystem that has basic game rules about no surveillance and respect for people and, and you know, the, that it's a, a clean, safe space, no bots, trolls. But then within that, there is room for sponsorship business models. There's room for companies to offer, um, you know, inducements to, um, to Customers, if you visit my site, you know, we'll give you this discount code. Mm -hmm. um, all of that kind of stuff is, is between organizations and their customers. And we want to support healthy market dynamics that are based on mutual respect. And we think in the long run, those kind of dynamics are what both, you know, individual people and many companies actually want. So the main, the main advantage of this is that the individual controls the data that, they, that other companies have and that they can accumulate their own data as well and get access, like, like seeing the file, seeing your medical file. Is this like seeing your advertising file? Well, yeah, and we could eventually, we're already in you know, um, hackathons or in the GDPR space in Europe where in order for things to work, people need to be able to share their data under safe terms with the health authorities or with their doctor and know that they're not going to be, you know, pers you know, in trouble because they turned po positive or something. Right. So, but the coming back to true, the, the first real advantages of the core true platform are not even at that data level. It's just treating organizations as first class parties on the network and setting things so that if I connect with some organizations and they post, I'll see their posts. There isn't an algorithm that's determining that I'm only going to see 6% of the posts from the organizations I want to connect to right. because they're be busy sending me all this other stuff. Yeah. Well, I mean, what happens if you've got 100 organizations you connect with? Obviously, at the moment, you're just doing it in time. But at some point, you want to try and um, tailor the feed to what the individual or the, or the company really is most interested in, right? Absolutely, and so the, the real paradigm is that the user basically has an agent operating their, on their behalf on the system, and each entity has an agent operating. And as we 
you know, initially we're using the fact that groups of people can filter content and then you could have your system pulled to get, you know, the top thing from the organizations that you're subscribed to first. Over time, we can actually let people have a machine learning agent operating on their behalf. So AI is very creepy when it's being done to me by big nefarious entities out there that are, you know, figuring out how to manipulate me and serve me what they want. Well, because their aim is to get you to spend money with the people who give them money. Yeah, or to manipulate me politically or whatever. I mean, I have no idea what their agenda really is. That I'm their product. Right. Um, whereas if, if I'm on the system and I control my side of the data relationship and what's coming to my feed, and then I want to in, introduce filters on it and, and look at the tailoring of how I want my attention space controlled. Right. And I get to see what's going on with that suddenly throwing an AI at that is very helpful. Absolutely. Because so now I can, yeah. I can use, it serves me instead of serving somebody else to make me the product. Right. Oh, I love this. So basically you get to see all the data nodes that would be used to filter uh, uh, news, that would filter uh, feeds to you. And you get well, to choose what to turn on and what to turn off of those. Exactly. And the other thing that's under this is at least within the system, you can see where something was first introduced. Um, in order to publish on the system, you have to declare real identity, either as an individual or an entity. You have to at least use a credit card to prove who you are. Right. You can be on the system anonymously as an avatar and, and consume, but if you want to introduce information, whoever publishes it has to take responsibility and has to have real identity. So you can trace back who took responsibility for putting something on the system and their reputation is at stake. Right. And then that, that's back, really who first, done. So who first posted it? Who first heard, well, who first published it? You could have somebody who, public, who posted it to a node. The node said, this is good. We're going to publish it. The node is now responsible on their real identity, oh, even I'm, if their user had, was a, a persistent avatar. Right. Okay, so, so I'm, I'm, I'm trying to understand there's a difference between posting and publishing. Well, ultimately, publishing is the introduction. It's very often, if you're an influencer, you're going to put up your own node and publish under your own name, right. you know, and put stuff on the cotton system. But if, if you had a, a network somewhere that was a bunch of activists in a country where the government was repressive, you could have a publisher that was publishing their combined content. People were posting there under their avatars. Oh, uh, so, so. Okay, so then the, the, the publishing node would, would take the responsibility for the data and for, and, exactly. and so it would be anonymous. The, the, but the node is, is the publisher. It's like we're, we're using much more a paradigm of scientific publishing or journalism where somebody has yes. a reputation at stake and then it's designed so the publisher can have curators so that have sort of an editorial board if it wants. How, how does this, I'm sorry, use this more? Well, the, the other side of it then is even as a anonymous individual, I'm signing things with a key. So I build reputation based on what I've done. If I get kicked out of enough nodes, it might be hard for me to join one because they could set it like I don't want members who've been kicked out more than three times. So it's all designed to balance personal privacy and free speech with reality and being able to know where things came from. Right, I love that. Um, is there some then element of like a trust graph that's being created here? You're familiar with Tibet and the Terran Collective? Yeah, so, you know, we've, we've been at this 20 years. Planet Work, you know, sort of convened the beginnings of digital identity. Mm. So a lot of the design of this goes back to literally hundreds of, con you know, thousands of conversations with hundreds of people over 20 years. Right. There's deep like experience and like why would we do it this way and not that way? What's happened is the technology has finally evolved in the last couple of years to where the puzzle pieces that made blockchain possible now make it possible to do much more elegant developer friendly ways of signing data. And we're, we're using new digital standards called something called the DID, which is an, the closest thing to an open standard for how you do digital identity 
you sign things with standard keys, um, you can countersign things, you can use one-off keys. So if I go and deal with a company, I'm not divulging my real identity, I'm giving them a one-time key behind the curtain. When I sign things on true, I'm, I'm signing with a key. If there's a ballot initiative, I can have a key so that we can show that even if somebody upvoted something across lots of nodes and networks, each person only gets one vote. So we can do real discovery of public opinion across the entire network. Wow. So do you think this, this is a future of potential voting? We'd be able to use True and J-Link? Uh, I remember a hacker once at a conference said, sure, I want internet voting. I want to know what the hackers want. Um, <laughs> I, so I think we can promise polling, which lets you discover public opinion in a way that can have a lot of weight in society. Whether that would really be voting, I'm, I'm hesitant about. But the other thing I really want to say about this is the underlying tech is designed to be decentralized in a way, not like blockchain talks about like, where do we make the coins? But like, we could move data with permission and provenance, like people's profiles and their posts across other privacy preserving networks. We're, we're building a network because we have to build one network to show how it works. Right. But the architecture of it is ultimately designed to create a larger interoperability across companies, across networks, across you know, other people that are also building clean social networks. We're, we're really out to create these enabling conditions on the internet and to demonstrate them, we had to finally just bite the bullet and build one system. Right, right. And so, and, and, and so really, it's, a, it's an example of how the application of the J-Link technology comes into being. Exactly. It, it, we, we had an open protocol. We started building software on the protocol. We, we built that stack. We had it ready for GDPR. There's no way that giant corporates are going to jump from where they are to adopting it. So we finally just came back and we said, what does our community really need? What do the networks of networks that we know and understand need in order to be more effective together? And I started building it for climate because I looked at the climate movement. I said, you know, we, we need this heterogeneous group of, of organizers and activists to be able to be more effective together. And so we're actually incorporated. The benefit corporation is called Carbon Path, which became Climate Path. And then we realized, even for the climate movement, we didn't need to build one network. There's plenty of networks. We needed to build enabling technology that would allow all networks so that everybody can pick which set of networks they care about and they want to be involved with. Right. OK, so how, how, is, how is the data that you're um, developing or the technology in the J-Link going to be able to apply to other networks? Like, will it have any? I mean. It will it have any impact on Facebook or LinkedIn or anything like no, that? No, I, I don't think it will ever have any fit, d impact. Well, hard to say never, but I think the dominant platforms are committed to a business model that is antithetical to what we're doing. Right. We are basically saying that every so often the internet goes through a revolution. We, we saw one happen, you know, in around 2000 when advertising came in. Before that, it was sort of, the internet was, you know, very idealistic. I think we're finally at a tipping point where people have begun to understand the consequences of what's happened and rules like GDPR and even CCPA are basically outlawing the dominant business model. Mm. In order for a new model to work, it has to ultimately be interoperable in our opinion. You can't create one giant new monopoly platform. Yeah. So what's actually happening under the hood with J-Link and True is every node has an account on a different, what could be a different server. It's at least a different service. So when I'm on with my personal user account and I share data with a node, with a company, with an entity, that data is moving between my service, my agent, and their agent mm. under a signed contract that's human and therefore lawyer readable. We, we automate legal agreements in JavaScript and we sign them with PKI. If another social network ran one of those servers, one of those agents, it essentially becomes its gatekeeper. Whether it's another social network, whether it's a corporation, 
it's the thing that is moving data out of its database and its system under an agreement over to another one. That's right. the JLink. Right. By doing that, it actually solves this problem on the internet where you go from what's called access control, where you have to log on to somebody else's server and you're in their, you know, in their system, to permissioning, which is what happens inside databases. Data has permissions about what you can do with it inside one system. Mm -hmm. What we do is we connect those systems so that now the permissions can move across the internet between different systems. And that opens up a whole different way of interoperating where when you share data, it's under terms that stipulate what you can do with it and, and what can happen and when, what you have to do if you're told to do something different. And at any so, point you can retract it. Exactly. If that's what the terms of the agreement say. So the, the agreements, can be standardized and live at URLs. And we have a, a first agreement we call a standard information sharing agreement for just sharing data personally under GDPR. Mm -hmm. But these things can evolve and fork like Git, you know, where you have more and more complex and forked agreements that people use in specific instances or for specific purposes. Um, these first agreements, you know, on True, we're still a tiny company. We had to just go build it in one system and demonstrate the potential. Mm. But the, the aim is not for True necessarily to be the thing, but for the J-Link tech to, to incorporate into all the systems. And, you know, both. We're, we're living in a capitalist system. We're, we're raising money in True, but we're being very purposeful in raising it from impact sources that are, you know, open to where things should go. I think a better model would be that right now, if you log in with Facebook, Facebook is sort of extending its tentacles to spy on you wherever you are. In the long run, if you log on with True, you'd be using the, the underlying J-Link to, to interconnect a network where the true business model is to have a more honest relationship with any other entity, either inside it or outside it, where we earn reasonable fees for, for what we're providing, but we're not trying to create a monopoly that excludes every other party that's got something that's built I need to operate. operate. There's, there's a few questions I've got, like in the future with this technology, uh, is it going to be possible to, because this is something that's come up in, in, in social groups I've been talking to, um, the notion that let's say I write a fantastic article and I publish it to the network and it gets a million views. Is there some sort of crediting system that comes to me as the publisher and the creator of that data? Because it, be, it can be mapped, right? Right, well, a couple things on it. Um, We've, we've had to make some decisions that are some ways not what people are used to in social. So if you're, if you're inside a private channel, things are very much like you expect in social. You can comment and upvote and, you know, then people can edit things and change them. Once a node or a network publishes something and then it can get republished by other networks, it's baked. So if your post gets a lot of reach, the person that reads it after 10 you know, republishings is going to still see your post, not what the editor said about it mostly. Right. And that provenance chain is going to go all the way back to you as the, the originator, the first publisher or the author. Right. right. If, if you're an activist and there's some sponsor for a network where things are being republished, you might be getting some of their sponsorship money flowing back to you. If you're an influencer and you do a deal with a, a sponsoring company because you have a lot of reach, you could be getting revenue back to you right. because you can see the, the reach of your piece across the network and you can see the reach um, where it's being right. republished, where the, sponsorship where the sponsor has a relationship. And so on those nodes and networks where the sponsor has a relationship, those views would be earning you revenue. Right, right. But we let each node and network decide whether or not it wants to have relationships with sponsors. Mm -hmm. Those networks that decide not to have sponsors are clean and you don't see any commercial activity. Those that do, 
you see very discreet, tasteful things with the sponsors like Favicon and their name, and it's clickable back to the sponsor's node. And, and, and would, as a user, would I be able to eliminate all adverts from any feed ever? Um, well, you could choose not to consume any posts that, had, that were sponsored, but I think, and I have to think this through, if you're consuming them on networks that don't have sponsorship, you wouldn't be seeing the sponsorship, even if those same posts are earning revenue somewhere else. Right, right. It's just where you're consuming them, the author would not be earning any sponsorship revenue. So it's like, do you want the originators of content to earn something in exchange for having a tiny little tagline on their post that has a logo and a name of a sponsor? Oh yeah, I mean, I was, I, I suppose I was thinking about like an advert that pops up, like, you know, the, like, Facebook. No, we have no ads that pop up. If you're on a network that has sponsors, the sponsor's logo would be integrated into the banner of the sponsor of the network. And the sponsor might have some posts, some agreed rotation on that network's feed. So every so often you got a clearly identified post that was from the sponsor. But we're not spying on you and we're not putting all kind we're the Aesthetics of it are more, once you get to the published level, it's more Instagram-like. Right, right. Okay, and so then, um, is there a, um, well, how, how, do you, how do you feel that this, like where will it go? Will it replace websites? So will, will the nodes themselves just have their node on true, their website? Um, I, I think it's very much like a microblog. Um, you know, so it, in that sense, it would be going after Medium or something as a place to post. Um, it's also designed, so if you're using Hootsuite or something and posting to a bunch of social, you could be posting here as well. Right. right. Um, we're going to support both images and pretty good sized video for free. Um, so we, we see it as being a place that people could start hosting their and posting their videos because you can earn revenue if you're, you know, in a clean model. Um, we're, you know, we're going after Facebook groups. We're trying to create a clean space for people to, to operate with each other and a very different dynamic where the groups are essentially subscribing to each other so that if you're part of a network, all the nodes and networks that are part of it, their published content appears in the private channel of that node. Right. Right. So it's, it's a way of sort of creating a nervous system where each neuron is a node or a network and they're feeding the best content from their context out to others. Right. And then the, the bigger the network you go to, the more you're getting sort of a greatest hits feed. Right. And, and so then you mentioned something about upvoting before. Uh, will this be like a wiki user uh, interpreted uh, and changeable um, system? Um, on the private channels, we've just built upvoting. Um, we think we're going to go to a kind of tagged upvoting, where if you upvote, it's not just, you know, I like this yes, no popularity, but, you know, this is relevant in this, in this network. This is funny. Um, you know, I just, I like this. So that you have some sense of that. But you could also um, do, for example, kind of a polling initiative that's just simply a vote should larger networks see this question? Yes, no. If yes, it tends to get fed up, and then you could answer the question, yes, no. Right, right, nice. And then everyone who's on here is has got a digital signature, so you know they're verified people. Exactly. So everybody's verified. When we do this polling, it's like a, a polling key, so you can do essentially secret polling. You don't know who is said what about an initiative, but you know that the results are substantially one person, one phone. If somebody really wants to try hard, they could game it, but then we're yeah, also going to go... Yeah. yeah, you'd have to have some burner phones. All we right, can yeah. screen out virtual phones, but, but you know, it's one person, one phone, really, one number. Yeah. Um, which is, a, you know, screens out a lot of troll-like activity. And then you can start seeing behavior patterns that might be associated with the phone and tagging them likely trolls. And, you know, so that you can do a lot to keep the space clean. You can't be perfect. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, so do you think that this, the, the changes that are going on in this uh, sort of 
moving towards this permission data are, are mirrored in the social aspects that are outside of the internet? We hope so. Um, I mean, we think at this point there's a lot of recognition in a lot of communities about how bad things are and how much people want something different. We also think that the dynamics of the sort of abusive manipulative system we have commercially has set the tone for how society itself is behaving. Mm -hmm. And that people behave according to sort of the conditions they're under. And if we can bring people back into more honest, humane, and sort of, you know, in a good sense, socially reputation, not ruthless reputation, but a sort of reputation is something that is embedded in real communities where it's, it's put in in ways in which there's possible for people to make mistakes and recover from them, but we're, we're creating game rules that encourage societies to be better. And the other key thing is that social says we're not responsible, but then disempowers everybody else. Mm -hmm. We say true can't play God, but we're going to create conditions where every community has curators that can set the rules for that community and enforce them. And based on reputation and, and building technology that lets those communities be functional mm. so that there can be different kinds of communities on the platform and everybody can decide where they're comfortable and what they want to do and how they want to participate and who they want to connect with. Right. Right. It's like you, you're re-empowering the communities to, to, to be the responsible um, gatekeepers. Oh, Absolutely. Right. And you can't dodge the bullet as the platform and say we're just a platform unless you design it so that communities can enforce reality for themselves. Mm -hmm. It also gets around this impossible conundrum of, you know, as soon as you make the platform God, whose rules is it supposed to enforce? So we do have rules like, you know, no child sex images, no, you know, overt violence, you know, really advocation of violence. And we probably are going to have to do that more on an image search algorithm because we don't want to be like spying on everybody's text. But we could run some AI that says if these kinds of images start showing up in a node or a network, we're going to flag it and we're going to send it to a, a private trusted entity, you know, a nonprofit that's looking for that kind of thing right. and let them go check it out. Right. I mean, what about things like hate speech and, you know, I mean, th there is this and, and things like conspiracy theory. Are you just going to let all that run? Well, as, as it does. Those are two different things. So hate speech is, I, I, I'm still, still working on the language, but no openly advocating for violence against self or others. Hmm. And, you know, it's up to communities to figure out what that means. You know, we, we can set, uh, we're going to try and set some very, very short agreement that we can all read and think we understand, and then communities right. are going to decide that. Um, conspiracy stuff, I think, is a really good question. It's, again, um, reality is such a mutable thing. Um, you know, many of us who've come from, you know, deep explorations of things know that it's not an absolute. It's a, it's a constructed thing that comes out of experience in society. Mm. But it also, um, for many people, rests on ultimately evidence and logic and who can, you know, claim something and back it up. And the other thing we're doing is if you have a truly closed node where the membership is private, mm -hmm. that's limited to about a hundred people. That's like people you really know and trust and you get to get together in private. We really push for things to get published across networks so that content that's moving across the system, somebody has to take responsibility for it and it has to see the light of day before 40,000 people are in a secret group in their own little, you know, echo chamber getting confused. Um, so that there's an opportunity for things that are being published to be commented on, discussed, and the credentials and the background and the reputation of people doing so can be vouched for. Mm. And I think that if you remove the 
advertising incentive for emotionally provocative content and you replace it with a system that tends to sort of check where things came from and who actually backs them up, a lot of conspiracy stuff may recede. Mm. Mm. Right. I, you, you can't be perfect, but you're not going to fix it by having an authority from the top say this is what's real and not. Right, right. So this is really a decentralized uh, uh, collaborative model, kind of exactly. like the village uh, wisdom, the wisdom of the, the genius of collective. It's a village I, of villages, you know. Um, it's, it's nodes are networks of people, networks are networks of nodes, um, nodes are communities of interest, practice, mm -hmm. they're, they're groups of people that come together around something. And then they, can publish up to larger groups what they think is important or real or valid. Um, and then you can subscribe to those areas you look want. So I'm sorry, are you saying a node can publish onto another node? No, a, a, a node is a network, a group of people. Yeah. Um, a node can be a member of a network. So the network combines things from nodes. Right. A network can also essentially be a node in another network. So networks n keep nesting, they okay. keep combining and get, you know, more and more, can get to essentially larger aggregations. Right. But you could also have a node that was just never published. You know, I could have my family's little private node and we share stuff with each other there. And we just use that for sharing things with each other and we're not publishing out of it. Right. And it's a private group where you have to authorize to come in. Yeah, there's, there's three flavors of membership. Wide open, you have to ask to get in, or you have to get sent a unique one-time use link to be invited in. Wow, I'm loving it. It's great. So, so then, at the moment, are you working with other collaborative social network creators uh, like Hilo? Um, what, what's your view on that sort of thing? And, and maybe um, Serve? We, we have not even had the bandwidth to, to talk with anybody. I mean, I know those guys from, you know, what the, used to be the Oakland Hub for years. Um, I, you know, I met the founders of Lumio when they were through town several years ago. Um, we've read work of other founders and we're really sympathetic to, you know, there's a lot of good people out there building really righteous networks. Um, you know, we have a tiny team right now. I've been self-funded up to this point. Um, we are just head down trying to build, you know, something that works. Right. I think we are unusual in that the underlying JLink technology, which is a separate company, licenses the technology to True. Um, we are, you know, the, the goal of, of JLink is to be completely promiscuous. There is no exclusive. In, in order for it to work, it has to be able to anybody who wants to use it. And a lot of what we're doing with True is just demonstrating what's possible. Right. What, what do you need now? What's, what's the next step <laughs> for you? What are you? Um, we need um, people to play with the still early beta. Um, so if you go to true.net and you go to the bottom of the homepage, there's a link to get true. It will invite you into Planet Work, which is the 20 year old network that this grew out of. Um, we do that to demonstrate that on true, you always have to be invited into some node or network. There's no page to go to get true. Then we're inviting people to create nodes to represent their, their organizations themselves, whatever. And if you want to, turn your node into a network. Um, we'll shortly have a way to just do that for a dollar, but right now it's, you can call me and email me and I'll have Dev do it. Hmm. Then we're gonna be out looking for uh, impact money and I have a pretty good network. Um, we've just been getting to the point where we have the beta and we have the name and everything's ready and we're now about to go out and, and raise with that. Hmm. And our goal is to get this into the hands of communities first that are trying to be a benefit to the world. You know, we, we came out of climate. Um, we think we can be relevant to Black Lives Matter. We think we can be relevant to Me Too. We think we can be relevant for a lot of distributed communities that are kind of decentralized in their nature. There are a bunch of organizations trying to cooperate. And then we're going to small businesses, you know, the climate collaborative um, networks of companies doing the right thing. Amazing, amazing. 
this is so exciting. It's, it's only just, you only just published at the beginning of July, is that what you said? Uh, it went live July 1st and we haven't really had time to put it out. I'll say one other thing too, which for Mark, you people like you were really aimed at. We're, we haven't got it baked yet, but we're, we're going to do a kind of founding, you know, partners, homesteaders model for the people who have big networks and are really in positions of connecting people mm. and don't really have a good way to earn, you know, a living doing that. Right. As we start to get funding to create a, a manifold to fund those people to extend the network and to be able to convert some of that into equity if they want, so that the people who, whose wealth is in their networks can use this as a vehicle to, to build something that's got long-term value for themselves. Right. That, I think that's, that's so important. Uh, I mean, as you know, one of the things that we, we see so much are, are people who are making connections and, and, and bringing people together, yet there's, there's like, where's, where's the reward for that? Right. And, well, uh, and, and I would also encourage you to go on the platform, go, go make a node, we'll turn into a network, mm -hmm. and put that link on this media when it goes out so that the reach of this thing is driving people to your network. Great. I love it. Yeah. I'm going to. So, uh, so, so that's basically to, you want beta testers onto true.net and, um, and then they'll, they'll go on and at the bottom of that, they'll see the link to planet home. To well, actually, no, I want beta testers on Marknet, on our body net. A body net. <laughs> body dot net. Yes. <laughs> that, that you should put up, you know, you should put up your own network and, and whatever the reach of this is should come to your network, not over to planet. All right. Well, that sounds good. How do I how do I begin that on true.net? You go to true.net. Um, you'll actually you go to um, go to the bottom of true.net. Use the Planet Work link to get on. Right. That's what um, I mean. Yeah. You have to use a mobile to validate yourself. Uh -huh. um, that lets you get on, and then you go to create a node, and you you make a node, and then um, shortly there'll be a way to turn that into a network. Right now, you have to just contact me, and I'll have them do it. All right, cool. Well, I'm going to play with it and I'll send it out to a few other people to play with. Sounds great. I love cool. the idea of having a, a non-abusive uh, um, data system. We do too. And, and we built it for you, Mark. We built it for the people who are out there really being effective on networks who you know, have, are doing great work and need better tools. Wonderful. Wow. Jim, thanks so much for coming on and sharing uh, your, your precious time and for, and for creating True and J-Link. Thank you, Mark. I can't. I can't help thinking of J date when. Um, <laughs> well, when, when I it, when I say J link, it came from um, JavaScript from JSON LD, oh, and it became JSON LD contracts. I see. I see. Yeah. Yeah. Well, my <laughs> my Jewish background is is coming out there with the, yeah. the J link. Uh, uh, thanks so much, Jim, for coming on. Uh, so excited to see how things are going. Uh, is there anything else you need uh, apart from the, the testers? Do you need any uh, data people, any, any programmers? We, um, you know, as soon as we start having some resources, we are going to be out, you know, hiring full stack developers. Um, even ahead of that, what we're really, you know, it's going to be sort of an informal line at first, but bringing in people who can do outreach, who can do onboarding, who who have experience with networks mm. and our, our model is to really try and create a, a you know, to push resources out to people and their networks as much as possible. Um, so those are the people we're really recruiting and then we're going to be recruiting a few coders. Great. Great. Wonderful. Well, I'm excited to, uh, to, to be an um, ambassador. I think there's space for ambassadoring there. I, um, I like that term. Ambassadoring. Yes. <laughs> Wonderful. Thanks again, Jim, for coming on. Uh, Thank you so great, much. Great work. Looking forward to seeing where it, where it all goes. Thank you again, Mark. Thank you. It seems obvious that we need to come out of this abusive model of um, hidden data acquisition and then, um, um, you know, like you, we see from all the minority report, all the futuristic movies, you walk through and suddenly an advert pops in your face. Hey, I saw you bought trousers last month. Hey, look at these trousers. It's abusive. And in a way, society is waking up to this um, abusive system. Like we have the systemic and the endemic racism, it's an abusive system. And like we have a patriarchy versus, uh, you know, 
uh, equal rights, abusive systems. And the internet was built, not on purpose, but built based on these same abusive systems. How can the 1% or the 0.1% control the rest of us? And it's through this um, data, now it's data mining because of the, the amount of information that there is, and they data mine and then they fire at you and control you via giving you emotionally stimulating things. And they know what emotionally stimulates you because as you're scrolling through on your phone, you stop at the thing and you're checking it out and they map your amount of time you're spending looking at it. And then they use that data to control you more. This is where Jim is really coming with the J-Link and True. J-Link's the technology behind the blockchain technology that enables you to map where, where the information comes from and thus the source of it and be able to either decredit or recredit it, um, not financially, but uh, um, uh, put it up in terms of, of validity for um, how well it's, it's articulating truth. And again, the names in, in the truth, truth. That's what we're interested in, truth. and not interested in being controlled and manipulated by sensationalizing reality so that we are just falling into this panic phase. Oh, I'll buy that. So this is where we're moving to now. And we're mapping it in society. We're seeing it and we're seeing it online. So reality is really filtering back into the internet because it was built from the non-reality of abuse. Now we're coming in and going, it has to be equal. and We have to be sovereign in, our, in ourselves so that we can, um, so that, well, so that we're sovereign, <laughs> so that we're independent beings, sovereign entities. And that's the work of this, it's beautiful. Uh, it, moving from, from an abusive data pattern to permissioning data. So let's all get on true and see what happens. Um, great, I love it, putting the control back in the hands of the people and, um, and enabling mapping of where the information comes from. I think that's very important. Because otherwise people just post and you don't know if it's come from Russia or bots or Facebook advertising. And then it just comes to you and you're like, where's this come from? I don't know. Does this come from the, I don't know, my Bob just posted it to me. That's the only thing I know, one level. Anyway, cool. <sighs> Check it all out. Great. I've got a book, Book Evolve, bookevolve.com. Evolve the book. Good. Book Evolve. As above, so below. Remember that we're moving for integrity and that's where we're developing integrity and authenticity and honesty and true, true.net. Wonderful. Thank you once again to my guest, Jim Fournier, uh, Max Markabadi. Uh, please share, it's that side. Please share, like the link, blah, blah, blah. Much love.